It's the most wonderful time of the year. It's Oscar week. This Sunday, filmmakers from around the world will descend on Hollywood and fight to the death, and there can be only one left standing, and that person becomes Oscar. What? They just give out some statues. Well, that's fun too. There are 10 films nominated for Best Picture this year. Now, I recognize not everybody is as chronically available as me, so you may not have seen all of the films, especially when some of them are three hours long. We must end the tyranny of three-hour films. I've done the maths. Primarily because making a spreadsheet is a fun way of making it feel like you're doing work without actually having to do the work. And I can tell you that the average length of the Best Picture nominees this year is two and a half hours long, and my bladder can't handle it. My bladder is an unknowable thing, which ironically sounds like a nominee for the short film category. I made it through all three hours of Endgame without needing to go once, but in Elvis, I went twice in the space of 20 minutes, and I hadn't even had a drink. I don't know. And honestly, the stress of trying to strategically plan my bathroom breaks is it's a little bit too much for me, my nerves, I, I, I don't know. Now. It may surprise you that I'm bad at small talk. We all hate small talk, but it's a part of the human condition. There's no escaping it. So we have to know how to deal with it. And I think a crucial tactic is to have a way out. And in my experience, the best way to escape small talk, the best ejector seat is a witty one-liner followed by a brief warm laugh. And then you say, I was just gonna go to the bathroom. Why is this about piss all of a sudden? Now, obviously you can't use that excuse too often or people will think you have a medical problem or a severe drug addiction. So you have to mix it up now and again. Maybe say something like, I just need to refresh my drink. And actually, if you alternate those two, that makes it seem like you've got a very efficient bladder. I don't know what's happened to me. The point of this video is that I've seen all the movies, okay? So if you're in a position where you're in small talk and someone's talking about the film and you don't really know what you're on about, you can sound informed, make your witty one-liner and get out of there. I've got you covered, okay? Here is your Oscars 2023 crash course. Adapted from a 1929 German novel, All Quiet on the Western Front tells the story of an idealistic young soldier who enlists in the German army and is confronted with the atrocities of the First World War. It is technical brilliance, beautifully photographed with a magnetic central performance and an unflinching approach to the brutality and futility of conflict. It's actually the third adaptation. There was one in 1930 and then another one in 1979. It's almost as if there's one for each generation, which I guess makes this the A Star Is Born for war films. <laughs> Excuse me. The sequel to the highest grossing movie of all time, Avatar The Way of Water tells the story of some blue people working with some lighter blue people to fight off the threat of some pretend blue people. And there's also a big whale. It had a budget of an estimated $350 million, largely due to the development of new technology to film performance capture underwater. And as a result, it's one of the most expensive movies ever made. Talk about splashing the cash. <laughs> Excuse me. I actually have another one. Okay, oh, do you know when James Cameron directed Titanic, it was so over budget that he actually forfeited his own salary to get the film finished. Talk about a sunk cost. <laughs> Excuse me. On an island off the coast of Ireland, two old friends come to an impasse when one decides to abruptly end their friendship with no warning and no explanation. Deftly moving between comedy and tragedy, The Banshees of Inner Sharon is a remarkable piece of storytelling from Martin McDonough, who is undoubtedly a master of the craft. And I've honestly never seen male friendships so truthfully represented on screen before. I mean, what could be more authentic than a man cutting off his own fingers rather than talking to his mate about his problems. <laughs> Excuse me. The life story of one of history's most charismatic and misunderstood characters, charting the course of Elvis Presley's life and untimely death, framed through the eyes of his shadowy manager, Colonel Tom Parker. With a production every bit as rich and lavish as we expect from things associated with the king, Elvis leans into our expectations in order to expose the inner workings and machinations of what it takes to make and sustain a star and what happens when it ultimately burns out. This film is so Baz Luhrmann, which I, I, some people don't love it. Did you like Moulin Rouge? I always think the world is divided into two people, people who like Moulin Rouge and people who hate fun. <laughs> Excuse me. I've never seen Moulin Rouge. A Chinese-American immigrant is trying to keep her family business afloat when she's alerted to the existence of multiple realities and tasked with saving existence by traversing and connecting with the lives she could have led. Everything Everywhere All at Once is a rare and bold film which has connected with audiences all over the world and has sustained that connection since it was released in March last year. It's an independent film that found and grew its audience through sheer quality and word of mouth. This is very much the little film that could, and if you ask me, it's gonna win Best Picture. I will say though, I didn't really like the universe where everyone had sausage fingers. I mean, I go to the movies to escape. I don't just wanna see myself up there on screen. <laughs> Excuse me. A semi-autobiographical tale from one of the greatest directors in the history of cinema, The Fablemans is a coming-of-age story about a boy whose love of filmmaking allows him to see the truth of his parents' marriage 
and navigate adolescence in a post-war America. It's a film about how art can reveal us and help us come to terms with the complexity of life. And this is a film Spielberg's been wanting to make for over 20 years. <laughs> Wouldn't it have been quicker to go to therapy? <laughs> Excuse me. The most celebrated conductor in Western classical music, Lydia Tarr, sees her world crumble around her as she struggles to address allegations about her personal life and her approach with her protégés. Tar sees a virtuoso performance from Kate Blanchett in the titular role, and is a film as precise and finely tuned as the orchestra she leads. A film about a top musician who takes young ingenues under their wing and grooms them for success. More like a Tar is born. <laughs> Excuse me, I struggled with that one. 30 years after the original movie, Maverick returns to the Top Gun program to train the next generation of fighter pilots for a mission that seems impossible. That wasn't the joke. A truly cinematic spectacle in the grand tradition of blockbuster filmmaking, Top Gun Maverick is a wildly entertaining thrill ride of a movie that is, in my opinion, vastly superior to the original. And I thought the stunt work in this movie was exceptional. I mean, it's the best aerial work Tom Cruise has done since he jumped up and down on Oprah's sofa. <laughs> Excuse me? A celebrity couple step aboard a yacht for a luxury cruise with super rich guests in this wickedly satirical comedy about the relationship between power and beauty. Triangle of Sadness is an English language debut for director Ruben Ustland, whose work has been lauded for his willingness to push the envelope and play with things that make audiences uncomfortable. The film got an eight minute standing ovation at the Cannes Festival. Can you believe that? I mean, I haven't seen this much delight in rich people's humiliation since the Gal Gadot Imagine video. <laughs> Excuse me? In 2010, the women of an isolated religious colony in America grapple with how to respond to discovering a brutal and disturbing truth about the men in their community. I was absolutely floored by women talking. It's exploration of gender, societal responsibility, compassion, fury, and the fearlessness of the performances by every member of this cast moved me to the point where this film, a chamber piece based around a discussion in one barn, had me on the edge of my seat. I don't want to oversell it, but I loved this film so much that I actually struggled to come up with a one-liner for it, but I will try. I can't believe Sarah Polly wasn't nominated for Best Director. I guess the Academy's still nervous about women talking. <laughs> no, yeah. But there, are, there are still inequality problems in Hollywood. And there you have it, all 10 films up for Best Picture this year. A few of them are still in cinemas and others are available on streaming and home release. Please do let me know what your favorites are or indeed what your best picture is that hasn't been recognized by the Academy. What really moved you or really entertained you this year? Let's give all movies their flowers. And then join me on Sunday for the show. I'll be hosting a party, so I will absolutely be live tweeting it, probably with a box of wine next to me. And I'll be hoping that the only thing that slaps this year is the best original song. <laughs> Excuse me?